In the last uh, four lectures, uh, we discussed about the seismology dealing with uh, how earthquake generates, how the seismic waves travel from source to site, how the ground motions are measured and then we studied uh, about the two major ground motion measuring parameter that is the magnitude and intensity of earthquake. Also we studied uh, the seismic hazard analysis which deals with the uh, seismic risk analysis of a region which is helpful in finding out the seismic risk analysis of structures also is helpful in obtaining the microzonation map of a region in terms of the probability of occurrence of certain uh, magnitude of earthquake or of uh, certain uh, peak ground uh, acceleration uh, or, or certain other earthquake measurement parameters. Now uh, in these few lectures we will be discussing about another important topic which is seismic inputs that is the inputs that we use for finding the response of the structures for earthquake. There are many uh, earthquake seismic or earthquake input parameters uh, are used out of that. Uh, the ones that is to be used uh, depends upon the kind of analysis at hand. In addition, some earthquake parameters such, with, such as magnitude of earthquake, peak ground acceleration, duration, predominant frequency, etc., may also be required. The input data may be provided in time domain as well as in frequency domain or in both. The data may be required in a deterministic or probabilistic format. Many times we require also the predictive relationship for different earthquake parameters for seismic and risk analysis of structures. So, we shall look into all these uh, uh, kinds of seismic inputs that we uh, just mentioned now. The most direct and simple uh, earthquake input is the time history record. The, it is the most common way to describe ground motion uh, using the time history records. These records may be of displacement, velocity and acceleration. Generally acceleration is directly measured, the other quantities that is the displacement and velocity they are uh, derived quantities. The raw measured data is not straight away used as inputs, these data are processed in order to remove the noises by filters, then we make a baseline correction in order to provide a proper baseline uh, to the earthquake data. Then we also remove the instrumental error and finally, the one has to uh, get a conversion from analog to digital data. At any measuring station, ground motions are recorded in three orthogonal directions. One of them of course is vertical, the other two could be uh, the uh, two horizontal earthquake directions. These three earthquake uh, records or uh, the measured ground motions in the three directions can be 
transform to principal directions. Major direction is the direction of the wave propagation and the other two are accordingly selected. They can be transformed to principal directions by assuming that the ground motion is in principal directions are uncorrelated. In fact, this is a true for our case when we uh, assume the ground motion uh, or uh, when we describe the ground motion stochastically. So, this figure shows the uh, uh, measured ground motion uh, in a major horizontal direction and uh, this is a acceleration uh, record. Uh, this is the other acceleration record again in the horizontal direction which is a minor or uh, in the minor direction and this is uh, again in the minor direction, but in the vertical direction uh, the ground acceleration record. Because of uh, the complex phenomena involved in the generation of ground motion, trains of ground motion recorded at different station vary spatially. For homogeneous field of ground motion, root mean square or peak values of ground motion remain same at two stations, but there is a time lag between the two records. For homogene non-homogeneous field, both time lag and difference in RMS exist. Because of the spatial variation of the ground motion, both rotational and torsional components of ground motion are generated. Equation 2.1 shows how we obtain the torsional ground motion from the horizontal or two horizontal uh, ground motions that are measured. The since the entire uh, ground acts as a plate, then if there is a phase lag between the or time lag between the ground motion at two points in this uh, direction say in this direction then there will be a, a couple which will be uh, induced or a rotation which will be induced about a vertical axis. Similarly, for the ground motion in this direction uh, if they vary uh, spatially or there is a time lag uh, between the two ground motions, then this will induce again a torsional motion about the vertical axis. So, uh, this is what is reflected in equation 2.1. Similarly, if we consider two vertical ground motions which has a time lag, then this will induce a rotation in this direction. So, uh, uh, this is uh, shown in equation 2.2. Therefore, we have three components of ground motion, two horizontal ground motion and a vertical ground motion plus we have a torsional ground motion about a vertical axis and a rotational uh, ground motion uh, in the uh, direction uh, of the, uh, the wave, wave propagation. In addition to this, there is an angle of incidence uh, of the ground motion. This is uh, defined with respect to the principal direction of the structure. Uh, for example, in figure 2.2, uh, we have uh, the principal direction of the one of the principal direction of the structure is lying along x direction and alpha is the angle of incidence that is the major direction of the earthquake uh, ground motion or the seismic wave propagation uh, is at an inclination of alpha with the uh, major axis. 
the time history of ground motion although is very simple and easy to understand and gives a direct picture about the uh, earthquake input. Uh, many a time we require the frequency contents of the ground motion and uh, these frequency contents of the ground motion uh, are used for many purposes. Uh, firstly, to understand uh, what are the kinds of likely predominant frequencies in the ground motion and if those frequencies are known, then one can design structures such that uh, the natural frequencies of the structure can be separated from those predominant ground motions. Also in the frequency domain analysis of structures for earthquake, we need the frequency contents of the ground motion and accordingly one has to uh, devise the input uh, in the in terms of the frequency contents. The frequency contents of the time history is obtained by the classical Fourier synthesis of time history record. It provides useful information about the ground motion also forms the input for frequency domain analysis of structure. Fourier series expansion of any arbitrary function of time t can be uh, written in the form of equation 2.3 where uh, the a0 is a constant and is defined later and the sum of the uh, sin and cosine terms. Uh, the physical meaning of equation 2.3 is that any arbitrary uh, function of time can be thought to be a sum of a number of harmonics and this number of harmonics uh, has a, a phase term that we will see later. The constant A0 is nothing but the average value of the function xt which is uh, shown in the form of uh, in the in equation 2.4. Equation 2.5 and equation 2.6 they describe a n and b n the two constants which are uh, associated uh, with equation 2.3 and omega n uh, denotes 2 pi n by t. 2 pi by t is the frequency uh, resulting out of the period uh, of period or duration of the ground motion. Now, in the Fourier synthesis, uh, we assume that the duration t which is there for the ground motion, this as if is repeating after time t and uh, uh, we can expand any function in the form of Fourier series on, uh, only when it is periodic in nature. The amplitude of the harmonic at any frequency omega n is given by the expression 2.8 uh, that is uh, a n square is equal to small a n square plus small b n square and this a n and b n has been uh, described before that is by equation 2.5 and 2.6 and they are squared to get the amplitude of the harmonic at omega n. The equation 2.3 can also be written in the form of equation 2.9 as I told you before by bringing in uh, a, a phase into the equation that is uh, a n cos omega n t plus b n sin omega n t can be written as c n sin omega n t plus phi n. So, uh, the value of phi 
n c n can be easily defined c n is same as a n that is computed in equation 2.8 and phi n is tan inverse uh, not b n by a n it is wrongly written over here it will be a n by b n is the uh, phi n. The plot of C n that is the amplitude of the ground motion at frequency omega n if it is plotted against omega n then we call it to be a Fourier amplitude spectrum or this is known as Fourier amplitude spectrum. The idea is to obtain the Fourier amplitude spectrum given a time history record. This time history record could be a time history record of acceleration. In that case, we will get a Fourier amplitude spectrum of the ground acceleration. And this Fourier amplitude spectrum would show the different kinds of or different compositions of the amplitude of acceleration associated with different frequencies or in other words we call them as the frequency content of acceleration. The integration in equation 2.8 the equation uh, that uh, we have shown before this integration now is done very effectively using uh, the FFT algorithm. Now, the FFT algorithm transforms the Fourier synthesis into Fourier integral and a pair of Fourier integral define uh, the you know, Fourier synthesis in a comprehensive fashion. For example, if x t is the time history of ground motion say acceleration, then the first integration would provide the frequency content of the ground motion x t. Whereas, the second integration would give back the ground motion or the, or the time history of the ground acceleration from the frequency content of the ground motion that is obtained in equation 2.11. Thus, equation 2.11 and 2.12 they form a Fourier transform pair. Now, using this Fourier transform pair uh, a analysis of the structure for ground motion can be performed in frequency domain and this technique is known as the FFT analysis of the structure in frequency domain. Now, standard input for FFT is n sampled ordinates of time history at an interval of delta t. Once uh, these n ordinates or sampled values of the ordinates are provided to the FFT algorithm, the FFT algorithm gives back n number of ordinates, each ordinate is a complex quantity in the form of a j plus i b j where b is the, uh, the imaginary part and a is the real part and this provides what is called the x i omega in equation 2.11. So, given n number of x t values or x values sampled uh, at a interval of delta t uh, n such 
values if we provide into FFT algorithm, then the FFT algorithm will give uh, as output n ordinates which will be the complex conjugate numbers or the complex numbers and they are nothing but x i omega sampled at a frequency interval of delta omega. The amplitude of the ground motion at frequency omega n is given by equation 2.13 that is a j is equal written as the real uh, term square plus the imaginary term square and then take a square root of that. So, this is the uh, amplitude associated with frequency omega n and the phase angle phi j is given as tan inverse b j by a j, where b j is the imaginary component and a j is the real component. The first n by 2 plus 1 values of x i omega, they are considered for obtaining the Fourier spectrum because after the n by 2 values, the rest of the value that is the other n by 2 values, they are the complex conjugate of the previous n by 2 values. Uh, therefore, in terms of the amplitude at a particular frequency that n by 2 values do not give any additional information. Similarly, so far as the phase is concerned that also do not give any additional information. Therefore, first n by 2 plus 1 values of the total n values of x i omega that is obtained from F, uh, FFT that is used for obtaining the Fourier spectrum. Fourier amplitude spectrum provides a good understanding of the characteristics of ground motion. The uh, spectrums, some of the spectrums are shown uh, in the figure 2.3. So, this is a Fourier spectrum for a narrow band earthquake meaning that the uh, there is a uh, concentration of the a frequency within a small uh, uh, band that is within a small band of frequency there is a, a, a large amplitude of the acceleration or the ground motion or any earthquake measurement parameters they are concentrated. So, this shows the broadband Fourier spectrum where there is not a there is uh, there is not uh, uh, a concentration of the uh, earthquake uh, measurement parameters within a narrow band of frequency, but it is spread over a broad band. Generally this broad band of uh, earthquakes that is uh, seen for the hard bedrock or in hard soil, whereas the narrow band ground motions or narrow band time history of ground acceleration, they are observed uh, for the soft soil condition. For understanding uh, the general nature of spectra, what we generally do is that we find out the uh, Fourier spectrum for a number of earthquakes and then uh, these 
Fourier spectrums ordinates are averaged and we get a smooth plot of the uh, Fourier spectrum. The smooth plot of the spectrum in log scale shows three important quantities that is uh, the amplitudes tend to be largest at an intermediate range of frequency. Then there are some bounding frequencies which are called F c and F max and F c is found to be inversely proportional to the duration. So, this is the figure which illustrates the previous three points. In the middle region, we have the maximum value and this is bounded by two frequencies F c and F max and this F c is found to be inversely proportional to the duration of the earthquake. Now, let us look uh, at an example uh, to illustrate how one can obtain the Fourier spectrum for a given earthquake record. For making a simplified calculation, we considered 32 sample values at uh, a delta t is equal to 0 0.02 second and uh, the FFT uh, of that is carried out. The time duration is t, therefore, the omega n value is equal to 157.07 radian per second and uh, d omega is uh, that is the frequency interval that is equal to 9.81. The omega n over here denotes the Nyquist frequency or the cutoff frequency. After this frequency, we find that the, the complex numbers that we obtain from the FFT, those complex number repeat in the form of complex conjugate. So, therefore, we uh, consider the FFT up to a frequency of omega n that is not for the total frequency that we uh, get in the uh, what we call x i omega uh, uh, plot. Now, this figure shows the 32 sample values at a delta t of 0 0.02 second. Now, this shows the real part of the x i omega obtained from FFT and we can see that the real part is symmetric about this point. That means, after this point or after this frequency, the it repeats whatever we get onto this side. The imaginary part is anti-symmetric about this point and whatever we get onto this side after this point, it is just a mirror image of those points. Therefore, the a square plus b square value or a n square plus b n square values on the left hand side of a and on the right hand side of a, they are same. We do not get any additional information from the right hand side. Similarly, the phase that we calculated that is tan inverse b by a, b n by a n rather 
you know, that remains also same for the two parts on either side of A. So, we consider only up to this frequency to plot the Fourier amplitude spectrum. Now, this shows the Fourier amplitude spectrum uh, drawn for uh, the first half that is on the left side of A and this shows the phase spectrum that is phi plotted against the frequency. Next to we come to another uh, frequency domain input uh, for the structure. Now, when we perform the a random vibration analysis of structures for future ground motion that is the ground motions are modeled as a random process not as a deterministic process. Then we require power spectral density function. The power spectral density function again is a form of input which is uh, uh, given with respect to different frequency or we can say that at different frequencies we have different power spectral density function ordinate showing the frequency again the frequency content of the uh, ground motion. It is a very popular seismic input for probabilistic seismic analysis of structures. Now, the definition of the power spectral density function of the ground motion is a very simple definition, but it requires some understanding of the random process. Now, the random process would be uh, discussed later in chapter 4, when we will be discussing about the response analysis of structures for future ground motions model as a stochastic process or a random process. Right now, let me give you a very uh, introductory uh, information about the random process. Whenever we talk of a random process or whenever we model earthquake as a random process, then we do not talk of a single time history. We collect it, collect an ensemble of time histories like this. this is one time history, then you have another time history. That way we can have a an ensemble of time histories. The larger the number of the time histories records, better is the prediction. Ideally, one must have an infinite number of records in the ensemble. Similarly, the duration should be as large as possible for modeling the uh, earthquake as a random process. However, for most of the practical problems, we have a duration of earthquake which is of the order of 30 seconds or 35 seconds maximum and we satisfy ourselves with that amount of duration. But ideally, if the duration uh, takes place uh, or the duration is of infinite duration, uh, then we have the ideal situation. So, uh, in an ideal situation, uh, we can uh, define or distinguish a random process if we have an infinite number of ground motion records of infinite duration. Now, if we have in reality we have uh, a finite number of ground motion records and finite duration. 
Now, if I take any time t 1, then at that particular time t 1, I will get the ordinate from each one of these samples in the ensemble. So, if there are n number of, of samples in an ensemble, then we will get n values of x t 1. Similarly, at some other time t 2, we can get n number of values of x t 2. If we take an average of these x 1 values across the ensemble that is across this sample, let us say the value is x bar 1. We calculate then x bar 2 that is the average value of x t 2 at time t 2. If we see that x bar 1 is approximately equal to x bar 2 and is approximately equal to x bar 3 so on then we can say that across this ensemble, the ensemble average is invariant with time. Similarly, one can find out the mean square value of the values of x t 1, x t 2, x t 3 so on and if it is found that this mean square values are again more or less the same, then we can say that the ensemble mean square value is invariant with respect to time. Now, in any random process, if we find out this criteria or this condition existing, then we call that random process as a stationary random process. And this stationary random process is uniquely defined with the help of a mean square value and a mean value. So, the random process can be said to have a unique mean square value. The distribution of this expected mean square value of the ground motion with frequency is called the power spectral density function. Now, we will look into this uh, power spectral density function more in details later on in chapter 4 as I told you, but for the time being with this definition of the power spectral density function, we will go ahead and we will show you how we can construct the power spectral density function. The expected value is a common way of describing probabilistically a ground motion parameter. Expected value means basically an average value. Expected value of a random variable means its average value. Expected mean square value means the this uh, the uh, squared values are average of the uh, squared values and these two quantities are closely connected to a to defining a stochastic process. Now, one type of stationary random process is called an ergodic random process. Many a time the ergodicity or ergodic condition may not be valid in a stationary random process. For simplifying the analysis or for simplifying the calculation procedure, many a time we assume ergodicity. Now, ergodicity means that if I take a single 
sample out of the entire ensemble, then this single sample has a mean square value along the time axis t. So, if this mean square value is same for all the samples and is equal to the ensemble mean square value, then we call the process to be an ergodic process. Now, in that assumption, it is implicit that a single time history sample taken out of the ensemble represents the mean square characteristics of the entire system. So, therefore, if our intention is to look into the distribution of the mean square value of the process, then instead of considering all the samples, we can take out any one's of sample out of the ensemble and look into its mean square value and then find out the distribution of that mean square value with frequency. Now, this can be easily done with the help of the Fourier series analysis that we discussed before. So, therefore, uh, at this stage the assumption of ergodicity helps us in defining the power spectral density function of ground motion with the help of a single time history and using the Fourier series analysis. Now, the rigorous definition of the power spectral density function from the ensemble of time histories will be discussed later. Now, mean square value of an acceleration time history say a t can be obtained from the time history itself and using Percival's theorem which states that the mean square value of a time history is equal to half of the amplitude squares of the Fourier series constants that is Fourier series constants are a n b n and a 0. So, these are the constants that you had seen in the Fourier series. So, the Percival theorem says the mean square value of the time history is equal to half of the sum of the a n square and b n square all a n squares and b n square plus the a 0 square. Now, this can be shown to be obtained with the help of the FFT algorithm in this fashion. Now, instead of the Fourier series analysis, if we carry out the FFT analysis, then from the FFT we get the uh, amplitude at different frequencies that is what we had shown uh, before and those amplitude squares are uh, taken from 0 frequency to n by 2 that is the first n by 2 plus 1 values of the FFT that we uh, consider to obtain the value of the C n square. So, C n square is nothing but the real uh, term square plus the imaginary term square and half of this sum of those uh, squares divided by 2 or half of that sum, uh, sum is equal to the mean square value. Now, the mean square value again by definition comes to be the integration of this quantity 
that is s omega say is the power spectral density function ordinate at a frequency omega. Then if we integrate uh, these function s omega from 0 to omega uh, n that is the Nyquist frequency that is the up to the point a in the figure that I discussed before. Uh, then that area under the curve e will be the mean square value by definition uh, because by definition the power spectral density function e is a distribution of the mean square value with frequency. Now this uh, integration can be converted into a summation uh, provided we say that there is a uh, function g n uh, and this g n varies with uh, uh, every frequency and uh, the g n value will be then equal to nothing but s omega into d omega. So, the, or in other words this s omega d omega if we take together then we can convert this integration into a summation and in that case g n omega is equa uh, equated uh, to s omega d omega. Now with this definition one can find out s omega to be is equal to c n square divided by 2 d omega. Thus one can obtain the power spectral density function for a ground motion uh, provided we have the frequency contents of the ground motion or Fourier amplitude squares or we perform an FFT and from the FFT we can take the real term square plus imaginary term square at every frequency up to the Nyquist frequency and with the help of those that information one can obtain the power spectral density function ordinate using uh, this equation that is s omega is equal to c n square divided by 2 d omega. A typical PSDF of ground acceleration is shown in this figure. Uh, we will then solve an example to show how we can obtain the power spectral density function from the time history of a ground motion. Now the same time history of ground motion that we considered for obtaining the Fourier spectrum that is 32 sample values of an acceleration time record uh, that was used and for each frequency we obtain the c n square value that is the real term square plus imaginary term square uh, that c n square value and then divided it by d omega. d omega is equal to 2 pi by t where t is the total duration of the ground motion and that divided again by 2 or in other words s omega is equal to c n square divided by 2 d omega that is what we uh, discussed before. So, that way we can plot these histograms, these histogram is spread over d omega and this value is equal to c n square by 2 d omega. Now, now if I join the center points of these histograms then this shows a the raw spectrum, raw power spectral density function of the ground motion. Now this can be made smooth by some smoothening technique, but if I add up all these histograms the area would be equal to the mean square value. Now here uh, those uh, uh, 
uh, the PSDF, the raw PSDF that we got that has been uh, smoothened by various smoothening technique that is 3 point averaging technique, 3 uh, then 5 point averaging technique, uh, then 5 point averaging car fitting technique and finally, this shows a more or less a smooth response spectra, uh, power spectral density function of ground motion obtained for the time history of ground motion having 32 ordinates. The sum of the areas of those bars uh, that we discussed was found to be 0 0.011. The area under the smooth PSDF curve was obtained as 0 0.0113 and the mean square value of the time history that is uh, the by just uh, squaring all the ordinates 32 ordinates and divided by 32 that gave a value of 0 0.0112. So, we can see that these mean square values of the of, uh, 3 uh, or rather the 3 mean square values uh, they are uh, matching quite well. So, in this fashion one can obtain the power spectral density function of a ground motion provided we assume the ground motion to be a stationary ergodic process and one single time history of ground motion then can be utilized to obtain the power spectral density function by the uh, use of the FFT algorithm. Uh, next uh, for many uh, calculations, we require the moments of the power spectral density function of the ground motion. Now, the, the, the nth moment of the power spectral density function is defined as omega to the power n multiplied by s omega and this d omega is missed over here there will be a d omega. Now, uh, this is uh, integrated again from 0 to the Nyquist frequency that is up to the point a that I had shown initially uh, uh, in the uh, figure of the uh, frequency uh, or uh, rather the Fourier uh, spectrum. Now, the 0th moment means simply area under the curve. So, the 0th moment is lambda 0 is nothing but the mean square value since the area under the power spectral density function curve is the mean square value. The second moment will be omega square multiplied by s omega and then you integrate over from 0 to omega n. So, this quantity called the big uh, omega or capital omega is defined as lambda 2 by lambda 0 that is the second moment divided by the 0th moment. Now, this capital omega is called central frequency denoting concentration of frequencies of the PSDF. So, or in other words if we wish to find out the predominant frequency content of the ground motion then we go uh, we obtain this value. The mean peak acceleration that is peak ground acceleration is defined using these three quantities that is the value of the capital omega, the duration time t and the lambda 0 value and is defined by this equation. Uh, and this was derived first by Davenport and later on this equation has been improvised uh, somewhat uh, in a better form, but uh, 
here we will be describing the peak ground acceleration using this formula and you can see that this formula requires the square root of the mean square value that is the root mean square value. Then we require the capital omega the duration and with the help of that one can obtain the peak ground acceleration. So, for obtaining the peak ground acceleration we require the moments of the PSDF curve and the uh, root mean square value of the uh, what you call uh, the ground motion. Predominant frequency or period is where PSDF and Fourier spectrum peaks. An additional input is needed for probabilistic dynamic analysis of spatially long structures that have multi support excitation. The time lag or lack of correlation between excitations at different support is represented by a coherence function and a cross PSDF function. In the next lecture, uh, we will uh, look into uh, these coherence function, the time lag effect and uh, for spatially long structures, how do we define the uh, power spectral density function that is a probabilistic description of the ground motion in frequency domain and, uh, using the PSDF, the coherence function and the time lag. So, uh, in today's lecture uh, what uh, we have discussed is that the uh, input uh, for the analysis of the structures for earthquake. So, these inputs could be uh, of several types and the one which you use depends upon the type of problem and the analysis that we are doing. The simplest form of the input is the time history records. Then one can obtain a frequency content of the ground motion using Fourier series analysis of the time history and can obtain the Fourier spectrum. And then from the Fourier spectrum one can obtain the power spectral density function of ground motion if it is assumed that the earthquake is a stationary ergodic process. Mm -hmm.